Okay, part four. We are doing part four. And so let's hop over to our content creation sort of roadmap of what we're doing over this four part series. So if we take a look, we went part one, creating the core database, getting those templates set up. And then in part two, we were looking at our content tasks and how you can link those to your content database and also create recurring tasks, which if you watch the second one and not the third, make sure you go and watch the start of the third because I did maybe lead you a little bit astray in part two accidentally. And I corrected myself last week in part three. And let's look at part four. So part four, this is where I talk about refining. So we want to start to look at what are your friction points, meaning when are you bumping up against things? When is your space not actually serving you? And this is a really, really important question for, well, for anything, any tool that you use. If you start to notice friction points, you want to address those. So I'll give you some tips for what's the criteria that I use for identifying friction points and then how can you start to address them? Because even in this live build, in the space I've built, when I look at it, I think, I would not, <laughs> I would not keep my space like this. I would definitely refine and adjust until I get it the way that I like. But I also didn't want to be spending way too much time on this live build. So I do hope you can see that you can customize pages and make them look exactly how you want. And we'll do a little bit of that today. Also, when you're creating content, if you are collaborating with other people, whether that is bringing guests into your content, if you are doing a podcast and having guests, if you are having someone do a guest blog post, or maybe you're interviewing someone, using Notion is a really great way to share a page and give permission for people to see. So whether that's an ongoing partnership where you might actually invite them into your space or Perhaps you just send them a link to a Notion page that you've created with the details that they need to be ready for your collaboration. The other thing, we'll talk a little bit about formulas. Now formulas, full disclosure, I'm still kind of wetting my feet. I do have some formulas in my workspace that I absolutely love, but I, there's so much you can do. And there are some incredible people in the Notion community who teach formulas, share formulas, have templates for formulas. So I'm not going to go too deep, but I do want to show you maybe a couple of things, give you some ideas of how you might start to incorporate some formulas into your content creation database. And, and connected to that is metrics. You could do a simple calculation saying, okay, whether you have a goal of producing a certain amount of content and you just want to track where you are relative to your goal, or maybe you do have the desire to track, say, subscribers or people on your email list and you want to know, you know, where are you on that trajectory? So that's a great example of how we can incorporate a formula. Um, both category changes, we kind of talked about this actually early on, but I can address if you are doing an overhaul, maybe you've already started putting stuff in your space and you add a new property and you think, oh, now I want to retroactively go back. How long is that going to take me? So we can we can explore that. And then mobile idea capture. So setting up a page that you can have on your phone using the amazing widgets that they have available for Notion on your phone. So you can just quickly capture a new idea when you're on the go because it's not always easy to navigate the mobile app. So I think having one distinct page to just jot down all of your notes, have them go directly into your content database as an idea is a great option that you can have. And I see there's a few other people who've joined alive today, Igor, Glenessa, Patrick. Hello, so happy you could be here. Okay, so let's jump into this live build. And we're going back to this content dashboard. Hi, Monica, glad you're here too. So content planning dashboard, <laughs> as I said earlier on, I, I, this is this is a friction point to me because when I look at this, I think this would not be my final version. I would not recommend this to somebody. And also think, when are you when are you doing too much work to get what you want? The beauty of a Notion workspace is that you can customize it and see what you need to see when you need to see it. So when it comes to friction points, I want you to take a look at your workflow. When are you bumping up against your workspace? When is it not serving you? And I think I may have shared this, and if I haven't, I'll say it now. A recent friction point I noticed is that I had my calendar view. I really like to see my content in the calendar view so I can quickly see when stuff is coming up. However, 
I also like to see all of my links. And so I had showed you an example of a links table view where there, I don't have any links here, but it would show me all of the links that I have available right away. And this is, as you know, anytime you create a new view, all of these properties are gonna show up in alphabetical order. So I would not have it set up this way. I would open my properties and I would move these around. So I might just toggle some of these off if I don't need those. And what I probably would do is have my link really close to the top. I might have something about the status of the, the video. Um, I also might have the type of video kind of up here. But then I can see really quickly, what's the name of the video, what's the link? Because I often find I need to grab a link. Whether So for example, today, I wanted to make sure that in the description for today's live build, I had links to parts one, two, and three and a couple of the other Notion videos that I've created. So what would happen though, is I would go and grab a link and then I would leave this page. Maybe I would go to my task database, do something else, be on another page, go in the sandbox. When I come back here, it's not in the calendar view. And that to me is a friction point because I like my sort of default view to be the calendar. And when I would need to go see a link, it would take me away from it. And then I would have to go back to it. So what I did instead is I just scrolled down the page and I created a new linked database that was just links below it. So that's an example for me of a friction point where I was getting frustrated each time I had to switch this view. So what I did instead is just created a second area that was still readily accessible that was always showing the links. And so now in my personal workspace, because this is a sample workspace, that is something that I did to address a friction point. And that is something you can do. And so what I have been showing you over the last few weeks is a sample of a dashboard where it's really this, this focus when you're on this page is of planning your sort of editorial calendar. When is stuff going to be published? But maybe that's not what you want your dashboard to look like. Maybe what you really want is a bird's eye view of what are the next few videos that I have scheduled to come up and what are the tasks that I need to do next. So that could be an example of how you might have a separate page. And so see how at the top here we have our content tasks, which when you click into this, we can just focus on upcoming content and tasks. So that's kind of what I was talking about. So maybe this is actually on your dashboard as opposed to your dashboard being the calendar view. Maybe you actually have a planning page where you have this calendar. That's when you actually sit down maybe it's once a month, I don't know how often it would be, that you map out what is the upcoming content that you have scheduled and doing all of that planning. Maybe you do that in a separate page. So your dashboard is more focused on what's immediate. What do I need to see right now? So that's something that I would like you to think about is what's the first thing I wanna land on on this dashboard? Because you can always create separate pages for separate functions. So I would love for the people who are here now in the chat, I'd love to know is there, what do you like to see when you, if you were to just land on your content creation dashboard, what is it that you want at your fingertips, readily accessible and ready to go? And if we scroll down this page, you'll see that I had sort of this task calendar down here with this filter option, which is what I showed you in week two, is that you could filter to a very specific, um, very specific piece of content and then plan your tasks. So you could have this here, but you don't have to. Um, we obviously created this little page as an example, which I ended up sort of abandoning. So now it's just a, a random page here. So I see Matt from All Things YouTube is saying, I like lists sorted by newest. Yeah, so you might have a view of your, so let's just take, so you could do a table view where the sort is your date. And that, would that be ascending or descending? Where's my date here? <laughs> I, that's embarrassing that I have to ask that, but let's move this date up. So this has, yeah, well, so this would be an order that it's upcoming. And what I could do, let's say I only wanna see what's coming up. I could put a filter and say that I only wanna see where the date is on or after today. So now what I've done 
is I've created a list where I see what's coming up first and then you see the all of the dates. So this could be an example where maybe this is what you wanna see when you land on this page is what is the piece of content and what is the date that it's happening? Do I have tasks assigned to it or not? Uh, maybe I want to see the type, the platform. I probably would want to see the status. So let's take, let's open our properties again and let's drag the status up here a little higher. So now we can actually see what's the status of all of these videos that are coming up. So maybe this one I am edit. You don't edit a live stream. <laughs> maybe I'm preparing a live stream or maybe because this is only in a few days. Maybe I've actually scheduled this already. So that's an example of how if you say, you know what, I don't want to see the calendar. I actually just want to see a list. So this is one example of how you could do that and how you can quickly change that and make sure you are only seeing exactly what you want to see. I see Monica saying, I start with the calendar view for planning and then I look at the task database for implementation. Yeah, that's great. And Monica, do you keep them on the same page or do you like to keep those separate? And hi, Frankie. Thanks for sh joining. And Matt says, can I ask a a data entry question. Of course you can. This is, yes, it's a live stream. I did this so that I can interact and answer your questions. So that's an example of addressing friction point. And maybe you would not have scheduled content. You could say upcoming content, or maybe you don't have a title at all. You don't need to. The other thing is play around with your views. Maybe you say, I don't actually like having these banners. Maybe you like to have some color. So I could do this instead, have some color, or I don't have any at all. You get to play around with it. Let's say that we want it to be a little bit more of a grayscale kind of feeling. Actually, we could try gray. We could have a little gray one. And then we could even, let's throw in a little, I always spell that wrong, divider. So we could have our upcoming content and I can just delete this extra block here. So we've got upcoming content and then maybe we do the same thing here where we get rid of this background and instead we add a divider and remember you can hold down alt or option and just drag a divider over to duplicate it so now we've kind of created this little element of oh yeah wait that's <laughs> need to do that gray so you could do something like this you could also if you wanted to create an actual image so maybe you have more of a design aesthetic that you want you could go in to say canva or another thing create an image and you can import an image so maybe you have um, some fun writing. Also, I won't get into this now, but for those of you who want to have a little bit of fun, you can look up, I think it's, I don't know how you pronounce it, but Katex, Katex, K-A-T-E-X. You can actually put in formulas into your workspace. I might be able to pull one up. Let me find an example just because it's fun and um, I can do it if I want to, because this is my live stream. <laughs> So um, I'm taking a look. Okay, so let's look at Matt's question. Um, I'll, I'll maybe, uh, where did I put it? I think that I put it, I'm just going to search it. Do a little search. Of course, it's not coming up <laughs> when I need it. Oh, and that's because I'm in my content creation. If I go into this workspace and I take a look, now I can pull this up. Okay, it's in my sandbox. And so here's an example. I'll just pull this over so you can see this. Um, and you might laugh at me, full disclosure. So this was me playing around with it. And let's, I can maybe make this a little bigger. So this is an example where these are all actually equations. And so, cause you can enter an equation. So yes, yeah, so I was just playing around with my name. <laughs> and then I played around with, this is cool font plus math plus fun because I'm a nerd and that's okay. I let my nerd flag fly all the time. So that is an example of how you can take a look and you can play with that a little bit more. I'm gonna bump this resolution down. Oh, not that much. Okay, so that is how you can also start to have some fun with how this looks and feels. And remember on any page, if you go up to the top, you can also play around with, do I? how do I want it to look? Do I want to use more of the mono, the serif or just the default? Um, so that is one of the things that you can do. And the other thing that I was going to say around friction points has actually just left my mind for a second. So I'm going to go back and take a look at, <laughs> I'm going to take a look at Matt's question. So Matt from All Things YouTube says, let's see if I can pull this up here. My oh, this is kind of hard to see. Let's switch to this view. And oh, you, it disappeared. 
My table is growing very large. When I enter a new item, I have to scroll the whole way down. It's a lot of scrolling. Is there an easier way? Okay, so yeah, yes, you do not have to go to the bottom. So when it comes to the um, entering something new, so let's say you do, oh, <laughs> you're still in there. So if I have a really long database, you do not have to add something new down here. You can add something new up here just by clicking the new button. Or if you know what you want a template, you can go here. And actually when you add it up here, let's say I wanna add a new live stream and I say this one will be uh, KTEX, KTEX, someone help me out here with how to say it. KTEX equa equations, um, fun with fonts. So this is my idea and I've got it here. And now this is filtered and sorted. So obviously that's not showing up. If I go, let me just remove this filter. Let's get rid of this. And now I've got the full thing. And now it's down here because I do have a sort. So I think it'll depend on your, your sort, but you can add it up at the top, clicking a new button, or I'm just gonna delete this one, clicking a new template if you have a template at the top and you don't have to scroll to the bottom to, to hit that new button. So I would say that's, if you're at the top or you're at the bottom, it is really easy to add something new to it. Does that answer it or is there another, maybe I'm also missed part of what you're asking. Um, I see that Monica is saying, I keep them separate. So your task and your content calendar, I use your strategy of ask, adding a task database to my headquarters for daily tasks and upcoming tasks and separate lists for personal. Yeah, that's really helpful um, being able to. So this is, I guess this is a really good point um, when it comes to your Notion space is that if you are just getting started and you are focusing specifically on content creation, you may just be focused on your content creation dashboard. But if you are using it for your whole either business or life or a task manager, project manager, you probably have a lot of different things going on. And so that is where you might have your upcoming content uh, on your main database or your main dashboard, I should say. So if you have that, you might just have little pieces of your content, but then you go over to separately when it's time to work on content, then you head over to your content dashboard or maybe you have a few different content pages that you've nested together. You can jump into the one that works for you and for what you actually wanna see. And Doc says we can dance if we want to. <laughs> oh yeah, the safety dance. Oh, that brings back memories. <laughs> uh, Matt saying math plus fonts, sign me up. Yeah, I thought you might like that one, Matt. Um, future video on formulas, please. So Patrick, when I, when I get better at formulas, we're going to talk a little bit about formulas today, unless you mean the KTEX, <laughs> KTEX, whatever it's called. Um, it, maybe I can do a little bit more research and just show you some fun things. I can do a short one. Um, okay, so let's get back into this and get back into this idea of friction points. The other thing I want to say around friction points is that you can sometimes find if it takes you more than a couple of clicks to get somewhere or to find something, I would say there's probably a better way you can set up your space. And so that is something that I'm always looking to do. If I have to dig, dig, dig to get to something, that's where you might want to say this needs to be at a higher level. Maybe you need to pin something to your favorites. For example, if I'm always going down into this content tasks, um, now this is only two clicks, but I might want to favorite this page so that my content tasks are really easy to get to. Um, so you can always favorite or unfavorite really easily there. Um, that's that's a thing that I think you should consider. Oh, sorry, I did not mean to do that. I don't know why that happened. Let's, let's also, I'm gonna make this look a little bit nicer. So I've got this divider here. Something that I sometimes do is I will put a divider at the very top of the page have a few of these sub pages. We're gonna create another page soon to share with guests. And then you can also add another divider. I've just duplicated that again. So you can start to create a little bit of space. Perhaps even you want to create a bit more space here between the top of your page. And you can kind of delineate that. Um, so you're starting to map it out and make it look the way that you want. Um, okay, I'm gonna talk about guests. So guests, we have our example, we've got our one guest, <laughs> just Doc Rock. 
uh, we don't have a, a key picture here. So that is this page here. Actually, as you see, this is just a database page. I can't click down here to add stuff because I purposely chose this as just a list of all my guests. So this is a full page database. If I go back and I say, you know what? I want to be able to communicate with the guests that I am inviting. And so I wanna create a page. So I am going to actually just drag this empty block below guests and I'm going to create a new page. And so this one will be, let's call this, so we're gonna create a page and we're gonna call this guest info. You can name it whatever you want. Um, you could say, thanks for being on my show, et cetera. And so maybe it has a little a wavy thing here. How do we, the wave. And actually maybe it does say that. Maybe it says, thanks for joining me. And this is a page where we want to give details for someone who is going to either come on as a guest for a video or a blog post or podcast, et cetera. And so you could, I really like call out boxes at the top of pages like this, because this is going to be mostly a text page. So a call out box always has a little emoji and a background. So if we start to write call out, we'll see it there we can select it. So you can see there's a little light bulb, uh, but maybe I want to change this to something else. You can change it to a little hand that's pointing, some information. You could change this with like some fire, whatever you want. And this could be a little note to say, uh, you know, I appreciate you taking the time to be a guest on my upcoming live stream. So here's an example um, that you could have here. And then please see the details below. This, this is really rough, by the way. <laughs> I'm trying to do this as quickly as possible. Let's actually do a different, what's a good emoji for thank you? <laughs> and let's just do this for now. Okay, <laughs> that's probably not what I would pick. Maybe you actually want to have a picture of yourself. So let's actually add an image. So I'm gonna say image here, and I'm going to choose an image. Let's go into, um, let's try and do this photos, and I've got some headshots, cat headshot, open. So here's an example where I can have a picture of myself. Now I don't want it to be that big. I actually want it to be a little bit smaller. And then what I can do to create a column is just drag beside it. So now it kind of pushes that video that over. And here I could have a little, um, you know, message from Kat, blah, blah, <laughs> you get the idea. So then we can, uh, let's go drag this block below. We can create a new block and we can have some instructions. So let's have a heading. I'm gonna do a heading three and just say, um, getting ready for the live stream. And then here's where I can have instructions. So I'd wanna say, check your internet speed, um, have a pair of headphones. I'm not gonna do this whole thing, but you get the idea. Um, open the link with this type of browser. So you are building this page, you're having this information, and then maybe I want to duplicate, have another title where I say, um, you know, a little about the show. And then I might say, I like to keep things casual. So don't <laughs> overthink this, etc. You're getting the idea. I'm putting together this little page here and I can have important information and I can share with people exactly what they need. And you can start to make this page your own. This is not the most attractive looking page, but once it's ready, you can click share at the top. You can say share to web. And this is, as soon as you toggle this, you're gonna see different options. So allow editing, comments, duplicate, search engine. I don't want this to be duplicated. This is just, a, stat, a page that I'm treating like a website page. And I also search engine indexing. I do not want people to find this page. This is something I've designed for my guests. And so I want that toggled off. 
I have the personal pro on my main account, not on this sample page, but I do have that option, but I don't want that to show up as a searchable page. So I would have that off and then I would just copy this link and I would send this to my guests and you could automate this. So maybe if you are booking in guests or confirming guests using some automations, you can have an email that that brings them this link right away as soon as they have booked a page, but you can put whatever you want on here and then you don't have to worry about going back and forth with emails, etc. Maybe you even have a page that is for so you want to join me or like, let's talk about having a discussion or being a guest. You could even have something embedded in here, like a link to a booking software, Calendly, et cetera. Um, so you can have that already embedded. So there's a lot you can do with sharing this type of page. And if we go back to our dashboard, you can quickly access this page. You can make edits to it. Now with the sharing, all I've shared is this page. I have not shared this page. Um, so, cause I haven't turned that on. This is not a share to web. So the top level page, not visible. This is visible. And if I created a sub page on here, so if I said maybe there was a page here and this was like upcoming content list where I did have a link to a table with upcoming content. So this is actually, let's talk about this because I know this Matt asked a question about this one. So I have my content dashboard and I say that I want to show a list, a simple list. And I'm actually going to, because I only want a list, I'm going to now delete that table view. So now all I have is a list view and I am going to filter this. So it is only where date is on or after today. So people will see what is upcoming. However, if I share this page, so anyone who gets this page will automatically have access to this one because you, you, if you have access to this, any sub pages, they will also be able to access whatever's on here. However, this upcoming content list is pulling information from a page that I haven't shared. So if I actually shared this with you right now, this would be empty because you do not have access to this table. And so that's something that you need to know. Um, if you are creating this page you wanna share, the content on the page has to also be shared in order for people to see it. Now the challenge is if I make that content database shareable or share that page, that also means even though I've got this nice simple view, if an outside person clicks on content, it will open the full database and they will see everything in this database because this database is shared publicly. Now I share this on purpose because I know that there might be a desire to create something like this. What's my upcoming content? I wanna have links. I want people to see which content is coming up and I'll just link to my original database. The, that's the challenge. If somebody clicks on content, they are going to open your database because it has to be shared in order for you to have this show up. And the way you can test this before you send a, sing a page to anyone, open it in like a private browser where you're not logged into your Notion and you will be able to see what you can and cannot see. Now, here's the thing. If maybe you're okay with them seeing this content database because perhaps when you click on this, you say, actually, there's nothing in here that's private. Maybe you don't want them to see like which clothing is here and you could say that you want to hide this so you can hide certain properties so that they're not showing up. However, if somebody opens this, they'll be able to see. And even if you hide these and say, okay, well, I still want to hide my clothing and I say, you know, always hide, that might hide it, but it's still there. However, if you have these tasks, if this task database is not shared, this will be empty. So test, always test any related things. Now this gives you the benefit that maybe you wanna create a really basic content database that you don't mind sharing with people. And then you just have these relationships and they can't see this. This will be empty if you share this with them because they don't have access to the task database. But what you don't wanna do is just share this entire page with all of your information. 
So I would say you have to weigh the pros and cons of whether or not you want to be sharing public pages with access to your databases. I personally don't do this. Um, there may be ways for like some, a way you could possibly get around it is you have a content database and then maybe you have like a public content database where you just create a copy because you can copy as soon as it's maybe ready and you just want the link to it and the name, you could just duplicate and move it to that new table. So that might be an alternative because the new table won't have all of those properties. It won't have all of that information. Hopefully that makes sense. I'm going to go back to the chat for a second. Um, okay. Okay. Uh, I don't know how to pronounce your name. Ilio WB2. Uh, the word processing program LaTeX is LaTeX. Oh, so I'm guessing it's probably Katech. Yeah, I think so. Or that makes sense. That is intuitive. <laughs> um, I've been having problems with formulas showing up properly in slideshows when I use my iPad and this might be a solution. Oh yeah, for actually showing equations. Is that what you mean? Um, because yeah, it's designed so you can actually, the, the whole reason for it, my understanding, is it's for math. It's so that you can actually display. So if you're a teacher, you can use those equations, like you use that language in order to, to show the equation, like that math font plus math <laughs> plus fun. This is cool. That's an equation. And so that's, that's the way that you can formulate it. So you could, if you could use that for actual math, which is what it's for, but it has those other cool features. Um, so Matt's saying gallery view question. I've enabled it. Let's, let's actually post this question. So I've enabled it, but my thumbnail field image field is super small. It's a tiny image sitting in a large white square. How do I make the gallery view pop and show a larger image? Oh, that's interesting. So I think it would depend on your, depend on what you're putting in there. So let's, let's do a gallery view, which I think I've got the videos one as a gallery view. So this doesn't have anything in it right now, but let's add a picture. So I'm going to upload one of my own thumb. So can you tell me, Matt, as a follow-up question, if you are putting them as a file or if you're adding them as a cover? So let's maybe test it. Let's do both. So I'm going to just pick my thumbnail for today. So let's add cover. I'm going to change the cover and I'm going to upload my thumbnail. Let's, I love going through my files and for, let's actually not do that. <laughs> I'm going to hide. I will come back. All right. I'm going to go into my files here, open my YouTube thumbnails and let's add today's thumbnail notion for content creators and we'll open that. And then I'm going to do the same thing. I'm going to add it as a file in the file property. And I will come back because <laughs> I know I made that mistake last time. Got in the zone. Okay. And actually, let's do one more thing, which, uh, no, let's just try those two. The other thing you can do is you can add your media into the body, like the content area down here, but because I like to actually use this to organize my information, I don't want that to happen. So right right now what we have is I've added a thumbnail here as a, a, a photo in a property and I've got it up here at the top. So if we cl close this, right now I've toggled off having, so anytime you're in your gallery view, you can open properties and there's card preview. I've got this toggled to none right now. But if I say I want the page cover, now you can see my the way that my thumbnail fits. So it's a little bit cropped on the top and bottom because of that size. So now let's go into the properties and instead of cover, I'm going to say page thumbnails and features because this is my file property and it looks exactly the same. So I think it depends on your, now let's try on the properties. What if we do, so small card, now you can actually see a little bit more, but obviously everything is smaller, but you can, it's not cutting off as much. And now let's try large. If we go to the gallery and say we want a large card size, this shows more of it. 
So you can kind of play around with it, but if you're doing that thumbnail size, which is the 16 by nine ratio, it looks like small or large gallery size are probably the ones that you want. Um, okay, and then, yeah, Doc is saying it is weird, but that's what it is, the LaTeX. And so LaTeX and KTech? Is this KTech? Anyway. Um, so that, does that answer your question? Oh, you are using a file field. So I would say it might be because you're using the medium. Although the, it's interesting about the white space because it also depends on the file that you're uploading, I guess. But if, if you're talking about thumbnails, then it looks like the 16 by nine will work nicely on the gallery view for the small and the large. I, I don't know what would be happening that you would have a bunch of space around it though for the others. And Doc is saying LaTeX, LaTeX, and Contact are all acceptable according to Donald Noose. Am I saying that right? Um, and it's Dutch. Oh, that's so interesting. And then Patrick is saying my weekly API update. So let's take a, I'm going to go here and show your comment. So should be completing my first draft of a Notion content WordPress plugin and I'll record a short demo. So can you tell me more, <laughs> Patrick? Are you Notion content WordPress plugin? So which direction would that go? Something that I would really like is if when I have published a video in, if, if I change in Notion the status to published, I would love if a new post in WordPress would be created with that, with the title and the link to the video. And then I can just go and have a draft and then I can go in and just add a little bit of text and publish that puppy because that is something that I would love to automate. <laughs> um, okay, so uh, uh, let's just call it cat. Wait, what? <laughs> okay, so let's go back. I've answered that question, I think. Oh, so Patrick's saying it'll allow you to display Notion content in your WordPress. Oh, yes, you were saying that. It kind of embed the Notion. That would be cool because I do, I would like to have a page on my website about Notion, but I still want to show some of the Notion features without necessarily taking screenshots. It'd be nice if it's dynamic. So keep me posted on that. That's really exciting. Okay, so we talked about the gallery view and those images. Let's go back so I don't totally lose my spot here. So collaborating with others. Oh, I do want to say, so sharing pages. We just showed how you can share a page. Let's talk about collaborating with others um, because this is an example of where you would probably just share this page and send it directly to your guest with a link. If you are collaborating with someone, so you guys are, you're working together, this is where if they, if you want them to have full access to your dashboard, you would actually want to invite them. So you would say, you'd put the email in here, you would toggle and say, what is the access level that I want to give this person? So if you are doing a full on collaboration, so you're doing maybe a show or a podcast with another person and you are sharing equally, you would probably want, now Personal Pro, you can give full access, but can edit is probably sufficient. So one person is in charge of the space and then the other person is able to edit content. They just can't share it with other people. Um, and so what I would say is the can edit is probably where you want to go. However, if you are collaborating, inviting guests in your space, giving them editing properties, I highly recommend you have the personal pro plan because the personal pro plan will allow you to see version history of a page. So if your guest accidentally deletes content or heaven forbid a full database, you want to be able to go back so you can restore the page the way that you want it. That is something that I highly recommend um, if you are going to be inviting guests. But essentially, you put in this person's name, you would then invite them to this page, and then they would have access to whatever page you've invited them to. So in this example, you're inviting them to this content planning dashboard. They would see everything that falls beneath here. So you can see all the different linked tables and things that we've got on this page. So these are all the sub pages and databases. Everything here they would be able to see, except if I don't give them access, oh, I'm covering this. Let me move this over. 
a little. There we go. So everything in this subpage, when I toggle down, everything that's original to this page, they would be able to see. Anything that they don't. So this task database, they if they don't have access, they will not see it. And maybe that maybe that's what you want, maybe it's not. If you also want them to have access to the task database, you would also share with that same person. So then that person, when you open this, you'll see the names of the people who have access to that page. And so then you would have the, this person have access to everything on content planning and everything on task. So when they are on this page, if they scroll down, so now with those large ones, let's just pop the calendar. When they go down here, they'd see this. If they do not have access, they would go down here and they would see any of the headings, but they would not actually see this, this table because they don't have access to it unless you permit that. So that's an important thing to know about sharing pages and collaborating with others. But it is a nice option for you to have because you can work on this together. So maybe you're working on videos with somebody or you're doing... Um, you're co-hosting a show together. You can have all of the information that you want in here. You can have make sure that they have access to all of the guest information if, if you invite guests as part of your show. So you'd be able to work on this together. But that's where really that personal pro is going to come in handy for making sure that if someone, up, uh, if someone accidentally deletes something that you don't lose everything. Um, okay, so, oh, Patrick, you said... Uh, Will do, but start to think of the integration that you mentioned as well. Yeah, that would be great. I create those posts. <laughs> um, okay, let's go back to this list. And is there anything that I went by really quickly so far about the collaborating or sharing that you have questions on? Because I want to talk a little bit about formulas. And I'll show an example. Let's actually show you. This isn't, so this is not a formula, but it's a cool trick. And maybe I did. Maybe I did show you this. So you know how we set up some information, or we set up <laughs> a new live stream. If we take a look at this template, let's open it in edit form. We've got this template here where it's a new live stream. It's gonna be on YouTube. It starts off as an idea and we have these recurring tasks. So when we actually grab these tasks and we, so we're making a new instance of these tasks and then we are dragging it in, although I don't want to do that right now because this is the template. Um, you are assigning tasks to your content. So let's do an example. I'm going to say new live stream. And this one will be, um, I'll say Notion integration with WordPress as a sample. So we've got this new live stream. Notion integration with WordPress is what it's called. And when we open our little tasks, we want to say our little tasks, that sounds demeaning. So we're creating new pages that are our tasks. And we know that this filter has automatically populated to this new title, the Notion integration with WordPress. And I'm going to, and let's put a date. So let's say that this is going to be in June. And we'll say that this is June 12th. I don't know if I have something already on the 12th, but it's on that date. And so with this calendar, I say, okay, it's on June 12th. So now I know that I'm going to prepare this live stream maybe a couple days before. I'm going to create my assets a couple days before. I'm going to promote this on the morning of my thing and then the day after. I'm going to clean it up a bit. So I've now added all of those tasks, which you now see show up under related tasks. So I don't think I've covered this yet, but I'm going to show you a roll up. Hey, Paul. Live build part four, no spoilers, I haven't seen three. <laughs> okay, the link to three is in the description. So now we've got these tasks that you have that are lined up. So this is, we know that when you have a little arrow that this is a related database. So it's pulling tasks from the task database. They're connected. What we can do is we can actually create what's called a roll up. So this is another advanced property. So if I say add a property, and this one is going to be, I'm going to call it task completion. And we are going to add a roll up. So under advanced, you'll see roll up. And you can only do a roll up when you already have a relationship. So because we have a few relationships, all these arrows show relationships to other tables, we can actually pull other information from that table. 
So for example, if we want to say a related task, which property do we want? So right now it's actually duplicating. It's pulling the name, but maybe like an example that you could do is maybe I want to know the amount, amount of eff mental effort required for those tasks. You could pull that up. That's not super helpful to me, but maybe you have, you want to see, okay, which ones are done? And you have these little check boxes. You could show the original check boxes. So there's none of them. Wait, do I have check boxes for, comp I do. Um, that's not showing. None of them are done, but I can actually say calculate the percent that are checked off. And so what this does is it will keep track of how many tasks of these four tasks that are assigned, how many have actually been completed so far. So this is not technically a formula property, but it is a formula because it's giving us information about how far along we are. And so we can actually, if we go into one of these tasks and we say, actually, I have prepared it. Um, so I click into this and I say that that is done. If I jump back into my content, which I can click on this content and go open the content page. So now we can see 25% is, is done. We've, we've completed 25% of our tasks for this video. So what we could do, because sometimes we're a little bit behind on checking off what we have and have not done on something, is we could have, maybe maybe we have a, I wanna do another example of a page. So I'm just gonna create a new block down here. Come on, I wanna create a new block somewhere. Okay, I'm gonna do this up here. Create a new block, I'm gonna drag it under content promotion. And actually, I'm going to undo that. Let's undo that. I'm going to go into content tasks and maybe each week I have a little cleanup. I'm going to, guys, why can't I create a, I'm going to refresh my page. Anytime your page is being finicky, press refresh and it should let you do stuff. Okay. I don't know why it's being like that. We're going to drag this down. We're actually going to drag it down over here. And this is where I'm going to create a little linked table that's sort of a tidying up type idea. So maybe I wanna call this a weekly review. Um, so let's do, let's call this, we'll give it a heading. So maybe we'll do heading three and we'll call this weekly review. I wanna make sure that I've actually done all the tasks for my recent content. So, and maybe you do this once a month. Let's create a linked database, which we know is gonna pull information. And so I am pulling my content and I'm going to say that I want to filter this. So I say, let me see. So first of all, I only wanna see stuff where there are tasks assigned. So I wanna say where tasks related, where my related task is not empty. So there's some task that's been assigned to this content. And then what I want to say is where the, where's my roll up? Task completion is, so we can do equal, we can do not equal, we can do our like greater and less thans, et cetera. And so in this one, we want to do less than 100. Help me out here. <laughs> this is really embarrassing. I think it's this. <laughs> I actually did really well in math, by the way. So let's, um, <laughs> I got the math word in grade 11. Woo. Okay, so let's go to properties and clean this up a little. I don't need to see who's assigned. I don't need to see the B-roll. I don't need to see the call to action, the clothing. Um, date is probably helpful to have. I don't need the description, guests, the link. This is a cleanup. So what I really want is this to be up as close as possible. This is where we can see all the task completion. So I know that all of these pieces of content, they have tasks associated with them because I've filtered it. So anything that doesn't have a task doesn't show up, but all of these are under 100. And so this one's really close. So let's open this one. We've got four different actions that are actually really close to being done. And I don't know exactly which ones are done. So let's open it up. Create and prep assets is the only one that's not. But I actually did do this. I just obviously didn't check it off. So if I click this open and I click done, 
Now it's 100%. And now the filter is not. <laughs> did I do it wrong? I thought I did it right. Okay. <laughs> it's still showing. Help me out here. Um, why is the 100% showing? Uh, because if they're all, okay, I'm not going to dwell on this, but you get the idea of, of having the filter. I'm sure I can figure out how this is doing. And I know Homesick Mac, you know Notion pretty well. So if you can help me out with why this filter is not working, that would be great. Or if anyone else has any ideas, I don't know why this is not working, but theoretically this would disappear because it's now done. Um, and so I'm just not sure why that filter is not applying that way. Full disclosure. And, um, Homesick Mac, a divider can also be added by hitting two dashes and it'll make a divider as well as an empty row. Oh, okay, cool. Um, so to be clear, let's try this. So a divider can be added by hitting two dashes. It'll make a divider and then, and add an empty row. So if I, but my problem is I have trouble just like dropping down to get a new block underneath. There we go. So now I just got one. So if we do two dashes, no, wait. Okay. So it took three for me. So maybe it depends. Um, okay. So, so should it be, so I see Christian, it should be larger than 100. So wait, do we just want, do we just want this one? No, because that's equal to, I don't want it to be, oh wait. <laughs> I'm really embarrassed that I'm struggling with this publicly on a live stream. So that's, that's a thing, but wait, so there should be something in between here. Well, I can't really do that. Can I, you know what? <laughs> I'm not going to dwell. I keep saying that. And then I keep dwelling. Um, okay. So that, that is not technically a formula, but it is kind of a formula and it is the type of thing where you can just make sure you look and say, okay, there are actions assigned to this and I haven't done any for these, but I have completed for the, you could even leave it. So it's a hundred and you could put these in descending order or you could organize it by date. So that was that. So let's take a look at though. Maybe you want to see, um, add, add a formula, and so this is not specifically on your content page. There are formulas you can add on your content page, but let's say I want to add metrics. And so I'm going to create a new page and uh, I'm going to do it that way that I did before where I cheat and I grab it here and I'm going to create a new metrics page. And so this one's called metrics and this one, I'm actually going to create a brand new table. And so let's do an inline database. So if I start to type database, I can see table inline. And this one, I'm going to say maybe content metrics, business metrics, whatever you want to call this. So let's create a formula. So first, what am I tracking? So maybe I want to track how much content I'm publishing. So I can actually say, you know, content total is something I want to track. Maybe I want to track my email subscribers because I want people to know about my content and I want them to subscribe for my newsletter. Maybe if it's in this case, it's YouTube. So I could say I want to track my YouTube subscribers and just check in with that every once in a while, see how are you on your trajectory that you want, et cetera. So let's play with these three. Now I want to start creating a couple of columns where I'm going to do some math. Because right now I want to have one that's called the current. What's my current number? And I'm going to change this to a number. And then I am going to set a target. What do I want to achieve? And so now I can create a number for my target. And now let's create a formula. Now you could do a really simple math formula where you are saying you are tracking um, your progress. But in this case, so we're going down to advanced. So we click formula. And so the formulas are very similar and you have, you can see the different properties that you can use. And so if you wanted, you could maybe say you've got your, how much you're doing over the target. So you have a really simple one. So let's say that I want 
to do 52 pieces of content this year and right now I'm at 20. Oh yeah, and to make it look, make it a percent and clean it up. I have done this before and <laughs> this is the part that I should have prepared in advance. Anyway, you can clean up the percent. I'm not gonna clean up the percent right now because I do wanna show you a, a more fun one, which is actually visual. Now I'm going to just copy a formula that I already have existing, um, which I don't have readily accessible, but the way that I get my formulas is I'll usually find people who have templates. So, so many Notion, uh, whether it's a Notion ambassador or just someone who loves Notion, publish templates. And if they have a nice looking formula in their template, I will download it. Um, usually if I download a free template, I will throw a few bucks as a tip to the person who put it together because I appreciate that they are doing that. Um, and then I'm going to use that. And then I'll just go into that template and I'll just grab <laughs> the, the one that I want. So let's take one. I'll show you two different versions that I have. So first I'm going to show you a, a, an equation that has more of a sort of a bar, although because I'm on live, it's obviously not opening. Here we go. So I have copied this from a template. I did not make this because why duplicate something that's already done? So let's delete this and I'm going to paste this formula where you can kind of see these progress bars. And all that math is done for you. What you wanna make sure is that you're all, you have the same name. So if you ever take someone's um, template or they've uh, they've offered it and then you copy it make sure that it matches so if if their template use different language you want to make sure that you update these so that the language matches so you'll see current and target throughout this which does match what i have here and then we say done now you can actually see it in a bar form so maybe my goal i've got kind of a newer list and i want 250 subscribers and maybe right now i'm at you know 35 I can see I'm 14% of the way. And maybe it's a new channel and my target is a thousand subscribers. That's kind of a big milestone. And maybe right now I have 400 subscribers. So you can see, this is fun visually. I really like this. <laughs> um, so you can see exactly where you are. Now, one of the things that I actually recommend because I started to track different metrics which I liked going in either every week or every few weeks and just kind of updating it and see how am I doing. But one of the things that you can, um, one of the things you could do is if you, let's say you actually wanted to do it by quarter and you wanted to have this rolled up into a quarter, maybe I'm getting too advanced, but what you could do is either have it where it's ongoing and you just keep changing the target or you could have, maybe I do a new one where I say my content total for quarter three is actually that I want to have a certain amount. And then I have this update. So at the end of quarter three, maybe my target for that quarter is to have 12 pieces of content. And I actually only got 11. I can leave this as it is. And then I say, okay, now let's make my content total for Q4 because now I have, now I'm going to set my target. So maybe this targets actually I want 14 pieces of content. And then as Q4 goes, you can actually see. So at the end of the year, you could compare, did I meet my targets at each quarter? And the reason I just want to point that out is because you might not want a moving target where it's like, oh, I hit my 250. So now I'm just going to up this. And now I'm going to say my new target is 500 you'll lose, you'll kind of not necessarily be able to see how you did in certain time periods. So if you want to track how you did in certain time periods, I would probably have create a new line item for the time period that you want to check. And maybe it's not a quarter, maybe it's a full year, maybe it's a month. You can play around with it, but that way you can kind of just create a new one. So hopefully that makes sense. I'm going to show you another, just another example of how it can look. And I'm going to open a different one. So I've got another template that I grabbed where this one has more of a block sort of progress. So, and it has a check mark at the end. Oh, actually this one does too, I think. So if we said, actually I did my 12. Yeah, it's got a check mark. But now let's see an example. I'm going to replace this with a different formula 
This one has actual squares. So maybe you like the square better. Um, this one is an X, <laughs> got nothing. Um, and so you can see there are just different ways that you can show this information. And so some you might like other more than others. And so that's just an example of how we can start to use a formula in that way. Now, there are a lot of different formulas that you can put together. Um, and so I don't want to go deep into it because just focus on making sure you're shipping content. <laughs> like I want you to be focusing on your content workflow, but I do want you to know that there are some um, cool ways that you can use formulas as one of your properties to be able to track how things are going. And so that's why I showed you the first example of using a rollup that already has some built in functionality, but then you can also use formulas like this to be able to show you something. And I'd also like to point out that at the bottom, you can also calculate things. So let's, and this is not the same thing. I wouldn't measure it here, but you could count all of the things. So I want to know how, I'm already counting it here. Um, you could have the percentage that are empty, the average, the sum, the min, the max. So you can actually use just the bottom of a table. So if you weren't familiar with that, that's something that you can do. Um, an example could be, let's do another, I wouldn't necessarily do this on the page, but maybe you have um, some tools that you want to track. So let's do a new database. Um, let's, we'll just do another table. And this one might be content tools. And you want to track the tools that you are using. So maybe you have your website host that you pay for. Maybe you are using a tool like um, Descript which can help with some of your editing. Maybe I am paying for TubeBuddy, which I am, it's great. <laughs> um, perhaps I am paying for Ecamm, et cetera. So you can have something like this where maybe you wanna track your cost. And this is where I personally will split. So I do have something like this where I track all of my tools and I will have, so cost will just be a number and you can actually format um, your number and say, I want this to be a dollar. There's also pound, euro, et cetera. So I want this to be in dollar format. And so maybe the cost of my website hosting for the year is 150. And maybe I can't remember how much the script is, um, but maybe it's a monthly charge and it's around 30, maybe two buddy. I'm just making up some numbers, 200 and then Ecamm. So like 350 depends on how you pay for it like this is a monthly one so i actually would say okay if i want to track all these costs is it what's the renewal and i would have select and say okay this one is annual this one is monthly this one is annual and this one is annual um, and let's pick another monthly one is perhaps you pay for the youtube premium and you want to track that. I don't actually have it. So I don't know how much it is. <laughs> what is it like 16? I don't know how much it is monthly. So the reason that I like doing something like this is you can actually then start to look at maybe I want to create a new view where I just have uh, it's another table view, but this one will just be filtered so that I only see where renewal is annual. So that's one option. What are the annual fees? And I can just say, let's, what's the sum? So I can see, okay, all of my tools, the annual tools, 700. Now let's create another one where I say, okay, oh, and actually let's change this name to annual expenses. I wasn't really planning on talking about this, but here it is. And then I'm creating a new one and this is called monthly expenses. And then we'll do a table as well. And this one, we will filter it so that we see our renewal is monthly. And then we can do this and say, okay, what's the sum? And we can see, okay, it's $46. So when you're trying to map things out, you can do that. The other thing you can do, let's actually add, let's go into the annual expenses. We're going to add a property and this will be renewal month. I do this and I have the select. And what you can do, let's just do this as an example where there's January 
oops, that's not a month, Feb and March. We're just doing three as an example. And so what I can do is I can also have a view and I could, I could do this separately or just create it here. Let's do a board view and say by renewal month. So I've got this board, I say create, and I want to group this. So I'm changing the group to renewal month. And I actually, so those are monthly, so they don't have a renewal month because they're every single month. So I'm gonna hide this. So now what you can see is exactly which month the charge is gonna hit you. So I'm actually going to go to properties and turn off renewal month because I don't need that to be duplicated. So now I can actually see, okay, when is that expense coming up? And so you can have this this way, or you could potentially have it in a list. So maybe you wanna have a list view. Um, we could say renewal month list, and it's just a cleaner view. And in this one, I would filter it so that this is only annual expenses. So where renewal is annual. And then under properties, instead of showing annual or not, we say renewal month. And then we sort it where the renewal month is ascending. And so you can see exactly what is coming up. Maybe you want to add the price. So I can say under properties, let's also show the cost. So you can have a little table where you can see exactly what is the cost for me to create content and when am I paying? When is it coming up? Um, and you can have all of that done for you. So I don't know if anyone is doing that. I really like that tool. Um, I don't keep my finances in Notion, just in case anyone's wondering. I will keep stuff like business expenses, how much a subscription costs. If that got out in the world, I don't care. But transactions, accounting, et cetera, I keep that separate because Notion and many of the other tools, Asana, Trello, et cetera, Evernote, they don't have the end-to-end -end encryption. Um, so I always think, what would happen if this got out in the world? If someone sees all my content calendar, if they see my subscriptions, boohoo. But um, for things that I want to keep more protected, I don't keep those in my Notion space. So, okay. Um, Patrick, can you do total at the bottom? Total of targets, average of targets. So I think I already showed that um, with being able to, to show the different things you can calculate at the bottom. For this particular metrics one, I, I wouldn't do it because they're all different numbers like apples, oranges, pears, etc. But you can do that. Um, and then why didn't you create that video? I was too busy creating the Notion template to track the video. Exactly. That is, <laughs> we don't want to get carried away. We, we want to take the time to set it up so that we can start actually creating stuff. And these are nice at, like, this is an example where after you've created your video, then you can give yourself permission to go in and maybe start tracking your metrics or to create something like this where you can track what are your content tools that you're using, how much are they, etc. cetera. Um, okay, and then Igor, I've made, uh, let's see this question here. So I've made changes to one of my templates, but these changes were not applied to the previously created documents. Fix that. Okay, so wait, let me just make sure I understand. Changes to one of my templates, but these changes were not applied to the previously created contents. Okay, so I think you're talking about uh, using a database template. So if you go in here and I edit this template um, and I say, oh, I actually want to add <laughs> tags to all of them. So that will not update all of your old ones. However, we can talk a little bit about bulk editing um, because you can do some bulk editing. So one of the things you would want to do is figure out, is there a way that like maybe it's by date? Maybe I know that all of my, these happen to be sorted by date. If I know that I just started doing this recently and all of these didn't have it, you can highlight all of the ones that are missing that information. You can click on the dots and you can edit a property in here. So if I added something new, like maybe the call to action button was brand new, I could say I want to change this property and I want to make sure all of those are connected to my content template because I actually did talk about my content te template and all of those, I could then check that off and now all of these have been updated together. So you could do something like that. The other thing you can do if you've changed a template 
is let's is to kind of delete the content in the body. So if we open this one, and actually there's there's nothing in here. So if I just click on this, it will update. It should update any empty fields. It won't override an existing field. But if I had one that's got content, what's one that I know has content in it here? No, <laughs> guys. Okay, here we go. This has a bunch of stuff in it. So if I actually grab all of this and I say cut, so command X in this example, and then I hit this again, now it will update anything. It'll give this. So maybe I actually, because before that didn't have these, now it's updated. And now I have these actual things here. And then what I can do if I want that stuff back is just say paste. And so now I've kind of added back this photo that I took. Um, and so I've pasted that back, but now I have the stuff that's in this template. So that's actually an example because I updated that template afterwards. So I hope that answers your question. Okay, you said exactly. Um, oh, glad that you like the point. Um, so Paul, you said great point about end-to-end -end encryption. Yes, always think about your your information and what's going in there and what's staying in there. And then um, Mac, I'm gl glad that you like that cost tracking tip. I think that that's really helpful. Oh, and Igor, it worked, yay. Um, let's head, head over here and just see what's next on the list. So we've talked a little bit about formulas. We've talked about tracking metrics. We just did the bulk category changes. So let's talk about how you can create a mobile page that is just for capturing ideas. So if you are out and you just have a brilliant idea and you've got your phone, you can just grab it and bring that in. So what you would wanna do is personally, I create, I have a page called mobile and everything on this page are just a dedicated page that I make for my phone because I like using the widget option on the phone. And because I like to be focused, my phone is not anywhere near, but I think I have a picture that I can show you of my phone with some widgets on it. So I'll, I'll pull that up. But what you can do is decide, okay, what are the pages that I want to have on my phone? So let's actually, um, maybe I'll just show you a sample. So here's an example of my actual workspace. I'm going to bring this over so you can see it. So I have on my phone, and this might be a little bit small. So I've got errands. So things, this is tasks where it's marked as an errand, meaning, and for me, errand is if I'm leaving the house, what is the thing? So maybe I need to pick up more toothpaste or detergent or toilet paper or whatever. I'll, that will show up because it's filtered. So I only see the errands. I do have one called pers today's personal tasks. So I can just quickly tap on that widget and open the personal tasks. I have today's work tasks. I like to keep those separate. I have new content idea. I have books to read and I have podcast notes. So this would be if I'm listening to a podcast on my phone and I, I think, oh, I want to capture that idea or something, a note about that podcast, I'll just click on that. So for example, if I click on this, you can see, and I like to color code them because <laughs> I like to color code everything in my Notion. So this will go into my library. And what's happened is this is filtered. So the type contains podcast and the status is in progress, meaning I'm currently listening to this podcast. And so because I have filtered this note, anytime you click new to a filter, it's going to take on those properties. So if we click new, let's pretend I'm listening to a podcast, automatically it will have podcast and in progress automatically um, updated because it's a filter. I'm adding something to a filtered database, which is the beauty of a filtered database. Um, and then this, this one has a lot of fields. So this is actually someone else's template um, that I did start adopting for my library. So I would put in the note. So maybe I'm listening to like Brene Brown and she's got a great point. And so I want to make sure I capture this. And then I would fill this out really quickly. Um, so for me, I might put it in the little summary area or I might scroll down to the bottom of the page and just start typing what it is she said and what I thought was great. And then, then I have that note. What will happen is later if I go into my library, so every week I like to go into my library and I can say, okay, it's no longer in progress. I've actually completed it and then it's gone. So this is the type of thing that you can do. So for content idea, let me just do a quick, a quick check before I share my page because I've learned the hard way. Um, so if we go to mobile and I go to content idea, 
Yeah, I don't really want to show this. So let's create one. <laughs> Okay, so we've got mobile. And so what you first can do, and I don't know if I showed this on the first day. So let's think of all the ideas that you want to have. So we want to have content idea um, or content ideas. Maybe we do. Maybe you like that podcast idea, podcast um, notes. Maybe when you're on the go, you also want to see uh, like a grocery list. If you're using it, I have a grocery list on here. Um I'm not showing it there for some reason. And let's just start with that. So let's, you write all those things down. You can actually grab all of these and turn these into pages. So now I've just created three different pages. So let's open content ideas. And on this page, we are going to connect our content database. So remember, you can say create a linked database. And this is going to be the content one. And this is where we want to, I'm actually, I like on the phone, I really, I highly recommend the list view because the list view is the cleanest view that you have. Um, and so list view, and I'm going to delete the other one so that it doesn't show up. I don't even want it to be an option. I just want to see the list. And now what we will do is have this where we say the filter is that the um, so filter, let me just check my filter. We want this to be an idea. So let's say status is idea. That will immediately, as soon as we add something, it will be labeled with idea. So we've captured it and it's got idea. Um, the other filter that I put in mine, which you don't have, I don't even think you would have to add, but you could say where date is empty, meaning there is no date assigned to it. So here's an example. You can see these are the ideas right now that we have. I haven't assigned them to a date, so they're showing up here. And so now what happens on your phone is you can add this widget, which I'll show you in a second, and you just click new or new, and you can start to have this idea. So if I click new, and maybe I do want to apply the template right away, and I know it's going to be a recorded video, I can click that, and it will update the information. So I've got my recorded video, and I can give it the idea. So maybe this one will be... Um, Notion mobile widget. So now we've captured the idea. And so on your phone, let me pull up a photo. I also see Paul is saying end-to-end -end encryption protects the hacker. I have a lot of sketch ideas. <laughs> Wait, what? Oh, that I don't, <laughs> that I don't want someone to. So Notion doesn't have it. So a hacker is going to see all of your ideas. Just, just saying. Um, so I know that I shared this somewhere. Here we go. Notion. Uh, <laughs> where did I put it? If I can't find this really quickly, I will give this up. But I know that I took pictures of my Notion widget. And then I shared them with some people for a class that I'm in. So let's just say Notion. This is not, not, I'm not finding this as quickly as I thought I would. <laughs> Wait, no. Okay. The widget on your phone. Let's actually do this. I'm going to pull up a website. That's what I'm going to do. And I'll show you the website. So Notion widgets. And if you haven't tried this, it's really great. And <laughs> guys, this is not going well. Let's search the Notion page for widgets. Okay. Fail on my part. So <laughs> if you have the mobile app on your phone, both Android and iOS, you can add a widget to your phone. If you've never added a widget, um, there are a lot of ways that you can do this. Um, or there are a lot of videos and information on how you can add a widget. But essentially, it can allow you in Notion, you can add one page. So what would happen is when it's time, you add that widget and then you say, I want content ideas to show up. Now on your phone, it's going to show you both the icon and the cover or just the cover 
Um, but I think that the widget looks best when you have uh, both an icon and a cover. So I recommend adding an icon and adding a cover. I really wish I could find this screenshot that this might be a disaster. I'm going to try one more thing before I give up on this. Is it by any chance did I put it there? No. Darn, guys. Okay. Um, Homesick Mac live stream with the highest smile, <laughs> smile per minute ratio. Thank you. Um, it's mostly that I'm laughing at myself for so this is a sign that I need to work on my uh what's it called? <laughs> oh Paul, that's nice. We get to hang out is a disaster. I don't think so. Yeah, I guess you could just shut this off if this is not what you <laughs> want to see. Um, but I did take a screenshot of the widgets and uh, the widgets that I actually use. And I just don't know where I stored them, which is just awkward. Um, so that's not it. And under pictures, that's my Notion workspace. Maybe I deleted them. Anyhow, the point is by setting up mobile pages, you can be very, very specific about what you want to see on your phone. And when you use the filter, when you add anything new, it's going to take on that filter. So it is saving you time so that you don't have to fiddle around. You know that when you tap new, you're going to add your idea and you are going to be, it's going to be filtered with idea. And then if there's any other filters that you want to apply to it, you could even, let's say we take this one further. Maybe we say we have one page that's called live stream ideas and this is just for lives so you would actually filter it where you say and the type is live stream so now you just tap this widget and you just get a new live stream then what we can do if we go back to mobile let's actually just duplicate this and then this page we can call maybe recorded um recorded ideas Whoop. <laughs> it doesn't want to go. Recorded ideas or recorded video ideas. So for this one, you would put recorded video and instead you would change this and say recorded. And then maybe you go one more and you say, actually, I also want to have one that is for blog. So now I have another one where I say blog ideas. And let's just change this where we say it's blog. So you could have three different widgets. So you can keep those sorted and organized. You could also, anytime you're looking, what are my ideas for the next one? You just tap on that widget. And so you can have all of these separate. And so you're just making things as streamlined as possible so that you are not having to worry about selecting all of those different properties on your content page. So that's something that you can do and set it up and it will, it will help you. For example, I know Paul has live streams and recorded content. So having those two separate ones could just be a nice way when you're thinking about recorded ideas, you're just in the recorded ideas. When you're thinking about live stream ideas, you're just in the live stream ideas. So you could do something like that. So that's one thing that you can quickly do. So let's pop over and see if there's anything else that, so I've talked about friction points, talked about, excuse me, collaboration, sharing pages, formulas, metrics, changing bulk things all together mobile capture ideas. So really I've covered the things that I want to. So I do want to give a moment if there's anything that I have not covered or questions that you have when it's connected to content. Um, a few things that I want to drive home as I sort of wrap up this series is to not be afraid to play around in the Notion workspace because as you have seen, it is really easy to kind of move things around, to kind of go backwards. If you do have the personal pro plan, which is around $4 a month, uh, you can have your version history. So if you made a big mistake, you can just go back and restore an old version. Um, they're just, there's so much potential to customize the space. I think my really big message around today's is if something's not working, fix it. <laughs> if you are finding that it's taking you too long to get to some information, think about where it should live. What, what would actually be much easier? I also really recommend that you think about workflow. So what am I, what do I need when I'm working on my content? What do I need in front of me? 
And then can I bring in those different views so that I can see those? And what's the format I like? So there might be some of you who don't care at all about that con the calendar view. I love the calendar view. You might not need the calendar view. Maybe you love the board view. Like there are some really successful YouTubers and I've seen their notion set up and they just kind of live in that board view. They want to see from status to, you know, filming to editing to published. That's how they like to see their content. So you get to pick what is the way that you want to work with your information? What's the information that you want to see? But I know that some people have said that they started using Notion and they just got stuck and they just completely stopped. And partly that could be, maybe it's not the right tool, partly, but it could be that they just hit a roadblock. They weren't sure how to get over. And so if you can learn how to break past that roadblock, it's very possible that you can actually just make a few adjustments with your workspace and make it work for you a little bit better. Another thing that I do want to say, and I do see there's a question, so I'm going to come to that in a second, but something else I want to say around the Notion pages is that, or, or the Notion workspace with templates. So remember, there are three types of templates. You can have a uh, database template, like the one I said, new live stream. That's where it's connected to a specific database. You can have the template button where you have those recurring content tasks as an example. Um, but then the third one is actually a Notion template that someone else created that you can duplicate into your space. When it comes to those templates, and I mentioned those for formulas, for example, I love grabbing, if I see an interesting template online, I love to grab that template and then I actually will download it and just take a look at it. How does it work? How is it configured? What's the formula that they used? I use that more as research. And with the exception of the library, I think the library is one of the only templates that someone else built that I'm using, but I actually noticed there are some friction points. Like there are some things in that database that I probably would get rid of. And so every time I'm using it, I'm like, oh, I don't love how this is, but I don't really have time to fix it. Um, or I do have time, but I'm just choosing not to do it. So I would say if you are using someone else's template, even if it's my content creation template that I have for free, um, if you download that, take a look at it, see how it works. You might be able to start adopting it or just use that as inspiration for building your own. And I hope that through the live build, you have seen how easy it is to start creating a new database, adding the properties that you want, um, and then use those other people's templates as a learning tool have it in your workspace, maybe have it in your sandbox. I have an actual space called templates for other people's templates. So I save all of the templates there so that I can always go and look what are the templates that I have collected. And then I will say, what can I learn from it? And then I will take that and use that as inspiration. But I usually build my own um, because you might bump into a few more friction points when you use someone else's tool because at, we all work differently and there's no one notion space that's exactly the same as someone else's, nor should there be. So I see Patrick is saying here, I'm looking for formulas more. It's just not calculating, but also, um, so actually, can you, I'm looking for formula. It's not calculating, but also formatting things nicely. So um, what part are you talking about in, like when you add a formula to a table, like the metrics example that we were talking about? Or I'm just curious about that. Or do you mean like when I, let's go over to the page that I created. So let's switch. So when we went to this metrics, which I would obviously give some sort of, let's do, is there a calculator? Um, ooh, Abacus, let's do that. That's fun. Um, so do you mean like the first one that I did where it was ugly? <laughs> So there's a resource that I really like. Let me, I have it in my library. So I'm actually going to grab that and I will, um, maybe I can share the link with you and actually tell it to you. So if you're watching the replay, so under my library, also in my library, I have a tag called notion and I have a tag called formulas. So I'm going to search formulas. Okay. William Nutt is uh, he's a prolific Notion 
um, Notion guy, really great with formulas. So I'm gonna write, I'm gonna give you his page in the chat, so anyone here live can see this. Um, so Notion VIP, that's William Nutt. He does so much on formulas. Um, other people, Red Gregory, great for formulas. So I would check out William Nutt. So the the link that I just shared is notion.vip slash formulas. That is a resource that I personally will go to when I'm learning. So with that percentage, I do have an example of a percentage in my Notion space where I, all you have to do is clean it up. And I'm pretty sure it's just like you multiply and then divide. And I can't remember exactly how to do it. But if you go to other people's Notion formula pages, there are so many people who are giving lots of value when it comes to the Notion formulas. So that is what I would check out there. I see, um, okay, let's see, Homesick Mac, thank you for the whole series here. Definitely <laughs> put me to work. Yeah, I would love to hear what changes um, that you made. Oh, I do have, there's something else I'm going to say about content creation versus getting started with a channel, but just one second. Um, Patrick is saying is more of a statement. Oh, formulas are not just for calculating things, make them to show different formatting. Yes. So if you look at the link that I shared, the, the formulas page, you can also just see different ways you can format things. You can clean things up. You can remove um, you can remove different things, almost like Excel when you can group things together, move things apart. You can do a lot of the stuff you can do in Excel, you can do in Notion, but also a lot more. And the, I think the Notion formulas, that's just scratching the surface. Um, Monica, for content creators, uh, okay, wait, let's, who are also creating courses, books, and other projects, do you keep a separate? Oh, that's a really great question. So I, yeah. <laughs> so my, my answer is yes. For example, when I am working on Anytime I work on a presentation, I think I've shown this in another video when I talk about preparing for a virtual presentation. So for example, in a few weeks, I'm speaking at a conference. So I have a page that is for that conference and then I will create a, an outline. So it's actually a table. I'll use a database table view where I have what are the different sections of my talk? How long am I talking? So I have actually, let me show you an example because in my course about presenting online, I have a, a workshop guide and I have a planning and engagement guide. And so let's just drag this over. I'll give you a sneak peek. And this is what, so this is what I give to my students is this is a, this is actually a template for my students and it is for planning your, your sessions. And so what you can actually do is you say, okay, this is the name of the session, the type of session, the purpose of the session, how, what's the size of the group, how many participants, all of that. But then down here is I actually, um, so I have a template called new session, which includes stuff like an outline. So if I have, if I start an outline for a talk, because to me, that's a piece of content, I'm doing a presentation, but I will create a session outline where I will say, you know, maybe I've got the intro and the intro is going to be five minutes. And maybe I want to do a quick poll at the start so I can get some information from people. And do I have an asset that I've got ready? So I mean, a visual or some sort of graphic. And then maybe I'm going to have after the intro is... I'll do some teaching about a certain topic and that will be 15 minutes. And then maybe I will do a breakout room. So I do this type of thing. Maybe the breakout room will be 12 minutes. And what it's doing is it's automatically calculating the sum. So if I know I've got 60 minutes with a group, I will take a look and make sure that as that adds up, that I'm doing everything that I need to do here. And I am kind of organizing what I'm actually doing for that presentation. So that's one example. I'm going to delete this just because this is <laughs> an actual active template. So that's an example of how I will, I will think of things differently. So when it comes to content, I like to ask the questions, what should be naturally grouped together? Now, there are probably some people who truly, truly believe minimize the number of databases that you have and just use filters so that you could just organize your information. And then while there's some validity to that, I would say a, an important question is, what are the properties? Like, how, how would I sort this? 
and start to think about like what do they have in common? Because if your content, if the public content that you're putting out there doesn't necessarily match with a course. If so if you right now, if we take a look at what I'm doing, I have a content database where I have all the different videos that I put out there. And I can track the links, I can track the thumbnails, I can track the tasks, all of that. But I also teach courses. I do not plan my lessons and my courses in the same content calendar because I don't want to see an editorial calendar of YouTube videos with my course lessons. To me, those don't hang together. They also have different properties. There are different things that I want to track, even if maybe you have recorded videos for your courses. Now, for some people, they actually might like that. They might like to see all of that information because they might treat it like a video and say, well, I'm recording a lesson. It's just like any other video that I create. For me, it's not because I want to be able to organize that information. Perhaps when I am putting together, you know, I have actually an up, like I've done some live training, but I'm also doing a recorded self-study course for online presentations. And so I am going to have a series of lessons and those will be grouped by topic. So I'm going to have some lessons on virtual presenting. I'll have lessons on preparing for your virtual presentation, sort of like what I just showed you with the template. I'm going to have stuff on, okay, how do you engage with your audience? How do you use a breakout room? How do you use a poll? Those all hang together. So I want to be able to sort those by category. I want to sort those, like that. They, those to me, I want in a separate database personally. Now I have considered using one database just for all of the lessons I have, and then I can sort and filter by course. But maybe you don't want to do that. You might want to have something separate. So I would ask yourself, does the content naturally belong together, but does it also have similar properties? Because you want to think about how to organize that. And also, how am I working with this information? When am I working with this information? So those are some of the things I would put together. Also, I think you might have said book. Did you say book? Um, that's another project. I wouldn't want to muddle my book information with my video information. I would have, because that's a separate project. Which brings me to the next point that I did want to share is that I think content creation is an ongoing area of responsibility. Uh, so a course that I am currently taking is Building a Second Brain by Tiago Forte and Forte Labs. And one of the things that he teaches is para. So projects, areas, resources, and archive. And I actually, before I even learned about this idea of para, projects, areas, resources, and archives with your, how you frame your information is that I had a project <laughs> called consistent content creation. And what was happening is every single video was getting attached to this, this project. And all of a sudden this project was amassing every single video. And I thought this doesn't feel right. It is not a one-time project. If you are creating consistent content, that's an area and so when Tiago Forte with Building a Second Brain talks about projects are different than areas of responsibility. So maybe you have saving for a down payment is a project, but finances is an area. You'll always have responsibilities connected to finances or health. Running a marathon is a project. Taking care of your health is an area. And so similarly, I like this idea that content creation is an area. You are ongoing responsibility. You're going to keep coming back to your content every single week or whatever your schedule is, but it's not a defined project because there's no end date in sight. <laughs> but if you are writing a book or you are building a course, that is a specific project because there is a time frame, there's an end date, and there's a very clear start and finish. And so I think it's really important to realize that when it comes to content, that content creation is an area and it's not a specific project. But for any of you who are getting started with something like starting a YouTube channel, starting a podcast, launching a blog, those are projects. And so I think you want to figure out which, which bucket do I belong to? So if you are someone who is just starting out with publishing public content 
or maybe it's a new format. Maybe you're pivoting. Maybe you've been writing, but now you're pivoting to a different format. That is a project. And that is where I would go into, if we like pop into this page here, is I would actually have a page. I've just created a new page. And this, obviously, if you have a projects database, you could add this as a project, but this would actually be its own project. So let's say your project is starting a YouTube channel, which a lot of people I know want to start a YouTube channel. This is a project. And so this is where maybe you have a YouTube channel project. And this could be, as I said, maybe you, maybe you have a projects database, but this is where you want to collect all of your information. This is Maybe this is related to your task database. Um, so if we had a projects database, we could do the similar thing to our content. So in a way, so imagine that instead of new content, it would be new project. And when we took a look at this template here, you can have something similar where you have all the tasks that are associated with that project. And so your task database, if this is a project database, we would see what's the status of the project. Is it on hold? Is it active, et cetera? And then you can attach all of your tasks just like you do for content. Now, in a way, each little video, little, every single piece of content you make is sort of like a mini project, but I would never put every single video I make in my projects database. To me, that would be overwhelming. So I like to keep my content separate, but every single video is like a miniature project because it has a start date and an end date and it's got very specific tasks. But I think it's different than projects. But starting a YouTube channel, this is a project. And so I would have a dedicated space where I collect everything about starting a YouTube channel. I would gather my research here. Maybe I have a library and I'm, I'm saving videos on how to start a YouTube channel. I'm saving articles or blog posts. Maybe I'm taking a course on how to start a video or start a YouTube channel. I would be pulling my library in here. I would be pulling my tasks in here. So I would have, what are the tasks I need to do to start my channel? What are the resources that I've collected? So all those videos I'm talking about, the library, those are resources when we talk about projects, areas, resources, and archive. So all of those things come together. And I think some people get stuck when they are just starting out versus when you are maintaining a new channel or blog or podcast or whatnot. So I think that's a really important distinction. And I just wanted to spend a moment on that because that can be a sticking point for someone. You can be completely stuck because you're focusing maybe on the wrong thing and you just might need to reframe it or separate it and say, okay, I'm actually just getting started. This I need to treat this like a project. Or am I, have I already started? I've got that stuff underway. Now my focus is how do I make sure I maintain this area of responsibility um, and just kind of treat that every little one like a project. Monica, I'm glad that you found that helpful. My little, my little side venture diatribe on, on the difference. I do think it's really important. I think you need to frame it in your head before you use a tool. You need to be able to understand how you are interacting with the information that you are collecting and organizing and sorting. All right. Well, that's, that's a wrap. If we take a look, we've covered all of these things, all of the links are in the description below. If you want to go back, take a look at any of the other parts. Obviously, as you are aware, I love <laughs> talking about Notion, so this probably won't be the end. Um, so if there are certain things that you are particularly interested in, drop it in the comments. Let me know or reach out and say, hey, this is an area I'm really interested in. I personally wanted to spend this time over the four weeks focusing on content creation because I really believe that this is an amazing tool for doing it all in one place and customizing it. And as I said before, it's not going to be for everyone, but be patient with yourself. Um, set some boundaries with yourself. And if you have questions, please uh, do reach out and ask, and I would love to help you out. I see um, Shane saying thank you for this next year. Oops, that's not the one I showed. <laughs> Ecamm. Um, thank you for the four-part series. When are you running your next virtual presenting series? So I am... I just wrapped up this week my May live training. And so what I am working on is actually a my self-study course. So I'm going to be 
totally honest here. <laughs> I struggle to put stuff out that doesn't have a date on it. And so I have been saying for months that I'm going to be recording this kind of self-study, go at your own pace course on online presenting. Because I know not everyone can attend a live training, their schedules don't allow it, or people just want to go at their own pace. And my initial intention was to create the recorded version, the self-study course, as I was teaching this May training. So I was going to do every Thursday I had my class. I was going to teach my class on Thursday and then record my lessons on Friday. But you don't teach a live course the same way that you teach a recorded self-study course. So I realized it wasn't as simple. <laughs> so my new idea, just didn't tell you my plan, is that I am going to be building my self-study course in June. But what I'm actually going to do is sort of pre-sell it at a discounted rate. So anyone who's willing to kind of buy it before it's done, <laughs> that will kind of light the fire under my butt to every single week be putting out lessons. So it will be dripped out slowly. Um, but that is something that I'm going to do to make sure that it just gets done. Because otherwise, I could just keep saying I'm going to record it, but I have no reason to. So if I actually say, okay, anyone who wants to jump on this train early, get on the train. because <laughs> You'll get a discount if you're willing to just help me out here. Because you're helping me by getting it done. Um, but that means that you won't get access to the entire course all at once. It will be dripped out as I create it. So that's my plan. <laughs> um, and I'm considering also doing some live Q and A's to supplement it. So if you're watching the lessons and you think, wait, I'm stuck, um, I do want to offer some, some support. So that is what I'm doing. Um, oh, that's great, Jane, that you are interested in that. I see Monica putting this into the para approach makes total sense. Thank you. Oh, that's great. Have you heard of para before. Um, this is something para, some people say para. Um, that's something that was a little bit newer. But as I said, with that content, I was sort of realizing that was a friction point for me early on. It was like, this doesn't feel like a project. And it's not. It's an ongoing area. But if we are starting something new, then it is a project. So for example, me getting out this self-study course, that's a project. <laughs> Whereas my regular videos, those are an ongoing area of responsibility. Um, so thanks so much for being part of this four week series. Glad to see some familiar faces coming back. Um, and for and hopefully if you are watching this on the replay, you sped it up a little <laughs> so you get through it a little bit faster. I'm a big fan of speeding up videos. All right, let me know what other content around Notion or the presenting stuff that, that helps me come up with my content ideas. Um, and uh, yeah, I guess I will see you all soon.